Aloha and welcome everyone. My name is Vivi Darmiasi from the Matsunaga Institute for Peace. Thank you for joining us today on our careers in peace building talk story series. This event is also co-sponsored by conflict and peace specialists at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Now I would like to hand it over to our professor, Dr. Maya Satoro as our moderator today. Maya, please take it away. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you so much for supporting this series and for supporting the Matsunaga Institute for Peace. And thank you also to Jose Barzola, uh, who does likewise and uh, is a co-creator um, with us. Um, today, we are so uh, fortunate to have Betsy Kawamura with us. Uh, Betsy is the founder of Women for Nonviolence and Peace and Conflict Zones. Um, she is a Japanese-American survivor of gender-based violence and has a remarkable story of resilience that has given her great insight and determination. Um, she works uh, internationally to empower other survivors, especially those of um, Asian Pacific background, um, through instruments including the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, um, on women, peace, and security. Uh, she has experience in the corporate sector as well and uh, background in art. And these wide-ranging experiences give her a multifaceted view and approach uh, to inclusion, peace, uh, and survivorship. Um, and so today we are going to have a, a wonderful, robust conversation with Betsy. Um, and after our dialogue, I invite you um, who are in the audience to ask questions of her. Um, those questions you can place in the chat uh, for now. And um, in the meantime, thank you so much for being here and welcome Betsy. Thank you so much, Maya. I really appreciate it. Um, I was very excited to have started on this discussion. I guess it was like um, about five or six months ago when we started talking about maybe I can do a presentation for your students in your network. Mm -hmm. And I especially, you know, appreciate this because I am actually like a um, graduate at the University of Hawaii in 1983, way back. And, you know, the UH campus in the 1980s was like pretty different from now and Hawaii in general. So, you know, when we discussed, started to just t talk about like, you know, perhaps I'm doing um, something to to share with um, the local, you know, the Hawaiian audience and the students about like the prospects of doing international peace building or conflict resolution work abroad. I thought that it could be a pretty good idea. So um, anyways, again, I really appreciate this time today. Well, we are greatly appreciative. Thank you, Betsy. So first of all, tell us more about your journey um, uh, to becoming um, a human rights activist. Um, and how did you end up working on um, sexual and gender-based violence awareness and advocacy? Well, um, I have to tell you that working as working on the human rights issues and working on sexual gender based violence issues was definitely not my career goal at all. Um, it's it's more like, you know, I went along living life as like a human being and there was like a curveball or some kind of frisbee that came in and completely took my my original life path away. Um, I was born in the 60s and basically I was um, I was born in California, but spent had spent a lot of time in Okinawa, the tiny island south of Japan, because my father was working for the military as a civilian contractor and my mother was directly from Japan. So we had spent um, a formidable time in Okinawa during the Vietnam War era. That was during the time that, you know, Nixon was the president of the United States and um, and basically, Sato Esaku was a prime minister of Japan during that time. And he later on, of course, as you may know, went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in trying to yeah, create like a, like a non nuclear Join the meeting. Um, the situation was that in Okinawa during those times, it was um, pretty much um, post-World War II. And um, there was a lot of um, discussion and dialogue on the status of force agreement between the United States military and, and the people of Okinawa. And basically Okinawa was going back and forth between going, you know, being under the control of the US military versus mainland Japan. Um, unfortunately, when I was 12 or 13, um, right before I left Okinawa, our family left Okinawa, I was, um, intercepted by a Caucasian man, most likely with the US military, and I was sexually violated over several days. It was not just a one-time situation. And actually, I think I told Maya and everything, I was um, I was trained as a classical ballet dancer, and here, 
this is like a very um oh I don't know like oh too bad oh okay this is um this week in Okinawa for those of you who actually lived in Okinawa you might be able to tell that this is um I'm sorry it's flipped in zoom of course you know it's like the other side but this is like a weekly magazine that comes out for those who um were living in the bases or or had dealings with the U.S. military and this is me on the front cover I was 12 or 13 then and this was actually done in April 74 and which is like a few months before I was um, sexually assaulted several times by a Caucasian man most likely an American working with the U.S. military then and I was about 12 or 13 and I was too scared to tell my parents and I didn't tell anyone I was going to sick uh, Christ the King school in Ginowan in the Maiha area during then. And um, well, you know, without telling anyone, um, I our family left. It wasn't until about three or four years later when our family returned here to Oahu because my father had roots here in Hawaii that I finally had the courage to tell my mom and dad about what had happened to me when I was going to Christ the King School. And then very unfortunately, my father and my mother both said that I shouldn't even talk about it for me to forget about it that I should talk about things that are more positive and brighter in spirit. And of course, that was definitely not the right thing to do in terms of your child being sexually assaulted. But I think, you know, I have to understand that my mother and father were from very um, conservative backgrounds. And I think my father was afraid that, you know, his future work, working for the U.S. military or any kind of future perspective for employment, even in Hawaii, would have been affected, perhaps, if he had tried to do something to to try to discuss and retaliate against the situation with um, the U.S. military, who could have been his potential employers in Hawaii, even um, in the 1970s when we came back here. So, you know, those were some of the issues that happened. And, you know, I, I basically tried to put um, the repeated sexual assault behind of me. I went to Sacred Hearts Convent here in Nuanu. It's no longer there. And I went to Sacred Hearts Academy. And um, I had an excellent um, mentor. Um, she was the principal of Sacred Hearts Academy, Betty White, who was like the principal there. And she was my history teacher. And she imbued in me amazing um, passion for history. And I knew, I always knew how to knack for it, but I didn't understand that I was going to be able to, you know, use my interest and passion for historical situations in society to work on my advocacy. So I graduated from Sacred Hearts Academy and went to University of Hawaii here. And I was a double major in um, business administration and fine arts. And I graduated here and went on to San Francisco State University to get my MBA. And during the time that I was in San Francisco State University, um, I met a Norwegian, um, a friend of mine through a party, and I had very little idea about what Norway was about or what, you know, Norwegians were about in Scandinavia, but um, it was a wonderful situation. I had met this wonderful Norwegian man and um, didn't get married, but we were in like a, um, a significant, a legalized, uh, you know, a significant partnership. And he basically said that, Bessie, why don't you come to Norway? And as I said, during that time, I was quite naive. This was in the 80s. So Norway, you know, Scandinavia or Norway was definitely not what it is right now. You know, Norway during that time, it basically had just um, found or discovered their oil supply. So it was a growing and emerging um, place in many ways, um, very stable and everything. But in terms of the cafe society, when one thinks of Europe, the rest of, you know, Europe, like Paris or London or even Copenhagen, it was definitely not the situation. But I ended up being in Norway and um, I was working for the pharmaceutical industry during that time. But, you know, I noticed that, you know, I was becoming increasingly um, very depressed. And um, usually they talk about like trigger situations in life that usually brings back um, traumatic memories. So unfortunately, that was what had happened. You know, my relationship with my ex-partner was very, really, you know, um, difficult because I was basically triggered by moving to a different country. And unfortunately, Scandinavia, at least in Norway those days, I experienced racial marginalization and stigmatization, which I was not used to. You know, here in Hawaii, you know, you don't encounter racial marginalization as a Japanese American because most of us here on Hawaii are Asian something. And also, you know, living in San Francisco and, you know, spending some time in New York, you don't, you did it well, at least during those times, we didn't have this racial marginalization. 
So being in Norway for a while, it brought those issues up. And basically what had happened is like a series of trigger effects. And I fell into a deep depression and I had to um, end up back in the United States. And during that time, after talking to several counselors and um, therapists, it emerged that a lot of my deep depression and the PTSD that was pretty severe um, basically was caused by the childhood sexual violence that I experienced in Okinawa when I was around 12 or 13 years old. Um, it wasn't just the repeated traumatic um, sexual violence as like a 12, 13 year old, but the very fact that it was never really addressed that my parents, you know, didn't really um, manage to really address it. That was like the the key part that led to my further debilitation. Um, without going through the entire details, I ended up unfortunately homeless at one point in my early thirties, and um, going under severe, you know, mental, you know, and physical hardships. Not even being able to complete the activities of daily living on a normal scale and finding it very difficult. Um, I had lost the ability to read. My PTSD from repeated childhood sexual violence was so bad that I couldn't read. And that's what led me to incredible um, poverty. And um, I ended up being homeless. And so this really does happen. And I was um, in and out of you know medical care. And mental health issues is a very important subject now, and like it's very much on the um, very much on the the focus these days. But mental health in the nineteen eighties, um, around the under the Ronald Reagan time, in mental health care, the quality was just really appalling. And when it came to trying to address the mental health issues of those who went under sexual gender based violence, it was a very poor time indeed in U.S. Um, history for for social care and for um you know mental health care of patients and so i i basically found myself you know not being able to get the proper treatment i needed and um and there was there was very little discussion about the fact that you know my um my assailant you know was likely with the us military and there was no recourse for me to have justice because of the status of force agreement that really made it difficult for local people to have some kind of justice or adjudication under the existing set of force agreements that created a definition for what was um, for the accountability of the US military committing various you know, human rights crimes there. So I grew up with this, um, basically some kind of miracle, Phoenix rising from the ashes maybe, you know, surviving and you know, overcoming um, the PTSD that made it so bad that I couldn't read and left me homeless for a while. And um, I was able to seek some kind of um, nursing, not nursing care, but some kind of care, some kind of um, empathy and care from a, you know, ex-partner, a different ex-partner's family. So I was in, I was in Sacramento for a while and I basically recovered, it took me about a year and a half to recover I was able to actually regain my ability to read again. And I know it sounds impossible, but when your PTSD is so bad, you lose the ability to concentrate. And I was not able to read very detailed or complex issues on paper. But my reading ability, <clears throat> excuse me, gradually came back. And I was gradually able to find um, employment again in my professional career then, which is in the pharmaceutical corporate sector. I was working as a consultant um, before the, the terrible PTSD. And I actually also worked for a bit for a McKinsey and company in Oslo doing information research. So anyways, um, you know, from that um, refuge, um, from that respite I had in Sacramento, I was able to try to get work back in the pharmaceutical industry. I ended up in Japan, not Okinawa, but mainland Japan during this time and worked for a German pharmaceutical company that was headquartered in Osaka. And working back in Japan as an adult in the corporate sector was an eye opener for me. Um, I found really serious problems with um, gender inequality. The fact that there were like so few women managers, you know, it was it was a very large German corporation based in Osaka. So it was Japanese German. And most of the management, they were definitely all men. You know, I remember like um, going between Osaka and Tokyo several times on um, an airplane just for business meetings. And on the airplane, I would find myself to be the only woman on the airplane because literally most of the other passengers were male managers, like going to the same corporate headquarters and everything. 
And this is, was also the time, and you know, the time sitting um, me back into the corporate sector in Japan was around 1990, 1998 or 99. And just to show you um, the, the gender, the, the slow progress of gender equality in Japan during that time in the pharmaceutical sector, I was told that it took over 10 years for the birth control pill for women to be approved by the FDA equivalent in Japan. Imagine that, it took over 10 years. But um, apparently, shockingly, when it came to Viagra, apparently it took less than a year for Viagra to be pulled through, pushed through the, the Japanese equivalent of the FDA and to be launched on the market. So that tells you something about the fact that, you know, like men's, you know, sexual needs were men's reproductive needs were, were thought to be much more important and um, urgent than women's issues. But, you know, and I and then basically I also um, noticed that it was amazing um, during those times of the 1990s. And I'm not sure so much about now. I think the laws have changed to make it stricter. But when it came to entertaining um, the clients, the doctors in Japan, as well as entertaining for the staff, you know, it was very common for us to go to these hostess bars. And as you know, I think some of you in Hawaii would be familiar with the hostess bars that basically you take your business, you know, managers and um, and your colleagues sometimes to go to these karaoke places, but the hostess bars are there and the drinks are very expensive. The, the entrance fees were like at least a hundred or $150 a person. And this was considered a legitimate part of entertainment and marketing fee for the Japanese doctors in Japan during that time. Now, I don't know if this is still the situation, but it was certainly a huge eye opener for me, you know, coming from the States and working in Norway where gender equality was really important. And, but anyways, um, as I was continuing to work with um, eyes wide open, being in shock of the gender inequality in Japan, um, I had met a French journalist in Tokyo who invited me to attend a discussion on North Korean refugee issues at a YMCA in Tokyo. And during that time in the late nineties, you know, I knew very little about North Korea I knew very little about the geopolitics of North Asian issues, security issues, and certainly I didn't understand the incredible hardships that North Korean refugee women went through. But just out of curiosity, it was supposed to be a two day um, conference. And so I attended this conference. Um, the first day was supposed to last for eight hours. I only lasted three hours because um, there was like a panel discussion of North Korean refugee women and men these are the North Korean refugees who escaped to North Korea, um, either went through Thailand or different parts of Southeast Asia, finally ended up um, on in um, South Korea, where they were, of course, handed their passports, you know, went to the Hanawan Reception Center and were made, you know, were prepared for normal real life in South Korea. And they basically had organized themselves with um, various civil society organizations and NGOs to create this presentation in Japan about what the North Korean situation like was like. So I attended this conference and it was, I only lasted three hours because I started to hear the stories, the devastating stories of the North Korean refugee women talking about the experiences going through human trafficking now, you know, as you can imagine, um, the currency in North Korea is basically worthless in comparison to Western currencies and what it was able to buy even in China and South Korea, of course. So what was happening is that, you know, many of the North Korean women, they kind of understandingly volunteered themselves to, to be sold as, um, as wives to Chinese um, farmers, you know, in the rural sectors, because um, it was during that time that it was the one child policy in, in China. And some of the farmers in the rural areas are finding difficulty finding wives. So, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, you know, it depends on how you see it, the, the North Korean women decide that it was okay for them to go through, um, you know, forced marriages or, or volunteering being sold to Chinese farmers as a way to survive and to get of North Korea, mainly because of the lack of food, lack of sustenance, um, lack of economic um, possibilities for prosperity and self-maintenance. So with the help of the human traffickers, um, they escaped from North Korea and landed into South Korea. And they were doing the presentations and they were talking about you know, sexual violence, the fact that they were often raped by the traffickers, 
when they went into um, China, um, it was it was basically a repeat of being sexually assaulted. The forced marriages, mo most of the times, or a majority of the times, the husbands that they do get married to, they are not treating their wives, their North Korean wives, very properly. And of course, as a North Korean, you don't have any legitimate papers in, in China, and your children do not have legitimate papers, too. So the children and the mother are most often left to left at the mercy or the kindheartedness of the villagers. Um, I don't under I don't really see any kind of changes or positive um, efforts being changed into that, despite several you know, appeals to the UN. Um, China, 1951, the refugee convention that China signed up in 1951. They are supposed to technically treat the North Korean um, refugee women and children as refugees, but um, China refuses to, to acknowledge that, saying that the North Koreans coming in from the DPRK are economic refugees and not um, those seeking human rights issues or, or any kind of justice escaping North Korea into China. And this is like a, content, a point of contention even now for the last 20 or 30 years. So after listening to those devastating accounts, and I think this the one scene that, that basically like um, prompted me to leave the conference was that um, I saw the actual children's drawing. These are North Korean children who managed to escape with their moms, you know, down to um, down to South Korea. And they they drew sketches of what their life conditions were like in the in the the labor camps in North Korea, and one of the children um, they drew they they drew this sketch of um, digging holes or trenches for whatever reason, and they were so they were so tired that they fell asleep in the trenches, and the soldiers just like mocking you know, they you know the soldiers just urinated on the children just to irritate them. So, you know, looking at these like images of um, children being urinated on by the by the North Korean soldiers and images of the incredible torture, physical torture that some of the North Korean refugee women and went went through through the child's drawings. Um, I couldn't take it anymore. I just left after three hours I left. But the three hours I spent at that one particular conference, and it was in 2001. And I still have the notes for it. I actually found the notes for it in my storage here like several days ago. Um, those three hours, it basically changed my entire life. Um, soon after that, in 2001, I decided to resign from the pharmaceutical sector in Japan, um, not just because of the conference, but because of many um, issues I faced with sexual harassment that I witnessed my secretary was going through by her supervisors from Germany um, who were trying to, I guess, um, you know, ask my ask a secretary out to dinner and ask her on dates repeatedly, you know, despite the fact that she said no and said that she had like a boyfriend. Um, those issues and many other issues that prompted me that I was not, you know, I was not being given a just professional environment to work in, in a corporate sector in Japan. So, after that, I decided to resign. And the more I dove into working on North Korean um, refugee issues, the more it brought about an idea about talking about my own stories of going through repeated sexual gender-based violence when I was in Okinawa. And the reasons were twofold. One of them is that, of course, you know, there were not too many Far East Asian or Asian um, women or even Asian American women I know who talked about their experience of going through US military sexual violence or talking about gender-based violence at all. Because, you know, as you may understand, in Far East Asia or, you know, in any other countries for that matter, it is very difficult to talk about gender-based violence and to be visible about it and to work on it on an international basis. So my other idea was that, you know, since I speak four languages, um, I'm bilingual in Japanese and English, although my reading and writing in Japanese is not that great. And I also speak Norwegian. I've done presentations in Norwegian and I speak, you know, kind of useful French because I lived in Paris for some time um, in my earlier thirties. So I was thinking that using my international language, my ability to present in a corporate fashion and to be able to think strategically about how to create a better awareness of sexual violence of Asian Americans or Asian women 
and also to talk about the aspects of U.S. military sexual violence that was not being openly discussed during those times. So, so a combination of that made me think about, you know, and basically, you know, change the direction of my my life. So when I was growing up as a child, I either wanted to be a, a corporate consultant, which I kind of was, and to gradually move into the arts. My ultimate dream was to be like a full-time artist, you know, photographer. And also I was professionally trained as a ballet dancer when I was younger. And actually, um, you know, my, my claim to fame is that during um, 1970s here under George Ariyoshi and Mayor Frank Fossey, um, one of the brilliant things they did was to create was the Honolulu City Ballet. Um, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the Honolulu City Ballet, but I was one of the original apprentices for the Honolulu City Ballet. So, you know, combining my artistic background, you know, and I've had exhibitions of my um, my paintings and photography in Oslo, as well as in Belgium and in Stockholm in the 1990s, I decided that, great, you know, I, I've facilitated some kind of combination of the culture and the arts in my corporate sector. And to use the combination of those to talk about the issues, to create like a visible platform for survivors of gender-based violence, especially those of Asian American background, and to break the taboos and to, to create awareness of this, because in Japan, as well as in other Asian countries, it was very difficult to discuss the issues of gender-based violence because, you know, many of the times the Asian women, they were very worried about like not being a prospective partner, not having a decent um, job, job perspectives, if you came out, were like extremely negative. You know, you're not supposed to discuss the fact that you went through gender-based violence. And also, there was also the obfuscation of the stories of the Recreation and Amusement Association women. These were women um, that these were women recruited by the Japanese military. Um, 1945, shortly after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when Japan capitulated to the United States. Now, many people understand or know about the South, uh, the Korean comfort women, but not too many people know about the Recreation and Amusement Association women. These were Japanese, mostly mainland Japanese women, about 55,000 of them who were recruited by the Japanese military in corroboration and with full knowledge of the American um, occupying forces, with the full knowledge of General MacArthur and also President Truman to sexually serve the US military that were occupying mainland Japan and Okinawa during that times. So, you know, the RAA woman, um, I, th since there's like, was so little awareness of this, my other part of my campaign, my advocacy was to create international awareness of this. And as I gradually um, decided to leave Japan, but to continue on my international advocacy on this, I decided to go back to Norway and spent a great amount of time there because Norway, despite of the fact that not being the cafe capital of the world or the artistic capital of the world, was very progressive in terms of, of working on women, peace and security issues. When it comes to the National Action Plan and UN Security Council 1325 and Women, Peace and Security, um, Scandinavia and Norway, in my opinion, are one of the, the leading countries in the world with a really fantastic national action plan. So, you know, I spent um, basically from roughly around, um, I would say 2004 till about, um, about a year or two ago, or actually like a few months ago, I had spent a great amount of time in Norway discussing Asian Pacific gender-based violence issues, the, the whole rhetoric of women, peace and security issues, and um, basically the Recreation Amusement Association and other parts of Asian gender-based violence issues that are not really known in society because my frustration was that every time I went to the higher level meetings in Japan, the Ministry of Foreign, I mean, uh, higher level meetings and also at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or at the various think tanks, you know, there would be, you know, many other survivors of gender-based violence, you know, let's say coming from India, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, um, Burma, Myanmar, but I never saw a fellow Japanese or not even a Chinese survivor of gender-based violence sitting at the high-level panel discussions. So I thought that there was really something wrong with that. And, um, you know, my last few sentences, I was just going to say that, you know, because of my <clears throat> hard, um, my very strategic and hard, um, you know, and, and, and very um, polished um, strategic um, 
ways for me to do this advocacy. I mean, I was very privileged just to work with um, people on the previous and the current Norwegian Nobel Committee. So as I explained to you, Maya, you know, I, I felt very um, honored to have worked with those on the current and the previous Nor Norwegian Nobel Committee and creating awareness also to them about wound peace security issues, especially about the issues of Okinawa, which is still embroiled in a lot of um, conflict in terms of what Prime Minister Kishida wants to do with the U.S. military bases there versus what the indigenous people of Okinawa wish to do. And many of them do not are not very pleased with the with the incredible number and the density of the U.S. military occupation in in um, Okinawa right now. So as we speak, you know, I think I did tell you from last year that I'm trying to make this transition from my very hardcore political work to embrace more of my um, arts and cultural side. And about um, about a year, year and a half ago, um, I decided to come back to the United States for various reasons. And I had a choice between the East Coast in New York City or else here in Hawaii. And I decided to come back here because of Asian Pacific roots, um, my grandparents' roots, and um, the fellowship I had with existing people here in Hawaii. So that's kind of like what brings me back here. And so I hope to, to continue and engage in the future, but more um, embracing the arts and culture this time. So sorry, Maya, my answer was very long winded. I guess it was like a 25 minute presentation I've done. So there you are. <laughs> well, I do appreciate so much your uh, candid sharing your, you know, your vulnerability. And uh, you remind us that um, those who are um, taking on um, advocacy and careers and peace and justice, you know, have often been through uh, tremendous challenges themselves. And it is that that enables you to feel the compassion and the, um, ultimately to, to build resilience as you move through the storm in order to help others to do likewise. I, I, before we move on to, uh, you know, kind of the art, uh, and, uh, fashion, um, work that you're involved with, I would like for you to perhaps um, give us some insight on the biggest challenges in stopping gender-based violences in violence and, and uh, acts. Uh, you mentioned uh, to me, you know, sort of obfuscation by governments, but, you know, if you can just uh, tell us your thoughts about both uh, the biggest challenges and what has worked internationally to lower incidents of gender-based violence and to empower survivors. You know, um, I have to be really frank with you and very honest. Um, you know, when I saw your questions, you know, a couple of days ago of um, lowering the incidence of gender-based violence, you know, I think I think that that's impossible to measure. I don't think anybody has actually statistically measured on the global basis, the, the statistics of how frequently gender-based violence is, occurs. Because one of the things, it's like severely underreported. You know, there's like incidences of domestic violence, like probably you know, every 10 seconds, you know, in some parts of the world, but these are not statistically recorded. And also when it comes to military sexual gender-based violence, I mean, this is even less recorded. I mean, despite the best efforts of UN, um, agencies and individual NGOs and civil society organizations and even the police force trying to record incidents of sexual gender-based violence, these are notoriously understood to be severely underreported. So we don't even have like the basic, you know, fine statistics. And also in terms of, you know, trying to reduce it, you know, my philosophy is this, you know, it's like being a doctor. You know, you you basically go to med school and then you become a doctor and you try to like focus on healing people. But this does not, but but you yourself being a doctor does not necessarily mean that there are less diseases in the world. I mean, honestly, you know, it's like, you know, you can be nurse, you know, you can be like a um, long-term care professional, especially being a long-term care professional and being a doctor, but this by no means secures the fact that there are going to be less diseases. Now you can argue that, okay, there's going to be less diseases like smallpox, like polio, you know, like some of the diseases that we managed to eradicate, even, you know, coming down to having like a much more, you know, efficient way to treat HIV and AIDS, for instance, or even diabetes. But the very fact is that, you know, various other new diseases are going to come up. You know, we have new diseases coming up due to just like the longevity of the human race. You know, we were supposed to die at 70. Now we're living until 80, 90s and about 100. So there's always going to be new kinds of diseases coming up. 
And I believe that it's something similar when talking about like trying to measure your, you know, your efficacy in the world of, you know, gender-based violence. So I kept on asking myself that question, you know, okay, so, you know, I am an activist. I'm basically like a, a, a lived experience activist. However, you know, am I ever going to be able to prove to anyone that my advocacy has actually led to the decrease of gender-based violence towards Asian women? Absolutely not. The only thing that I can perhaps encourage myself on or to, you know, validate or to pat myself on the shoulders is to hope that I've encouraged other Asian women to at least acknowledge the fact that they went through gender-based violence instead of brushing it off. I think a lot of the issues we have in Far East Asia, and also not just in Far East Asia, but perhaps the Middle East and around the world, is that even if we do encounter gender-based violence, and actually I'm in, you know, in broadening this vision, not just to women who, you know, who experience, you know, gender-based violence, but also to men. You know, we're living in the LGBTQ community. And, you know, we have to understand that no matter whether you're gay or straight or, or you know, trans or non-binary, gender-based violence, violence is violence. And then I think one of the things that I can basically, like, hopefully rest myself assured is that I've created an awareness of these people to acknowledge the fact is that, you know, if they went through gender-based violence, it's not just something to be dismissed. You know, I mean, you know, I don't want people to be gaslit into thinking that that was not such a big deal anymore. So that is one of the 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 progress I think I hope I have done is to have the Asian woman understand that the violence they had experienced is real. And you don't make excuses. You don't just say that, oh, well, it just happened. You know, it's Asia. These things do happen. Yes, they do happen. But that doesn't mean that it's supposed to happen. And I think I wanted to also take like a like a take a very proactive role and to encourage the woman to take a much more proactive role as to holding their perpetrators accountable for the violence they they you know they they perpetuate to their victims and their survivors. And but you know, other than that, in terms of you know tips for other people who want to work in women, peace, and security issues, you know, and I was thinking about this very carefully last night, you know, I mean. The field of working women, peace, and securities is a little bit different from other fields is because, you know, I want for people to working in this field not to think of their work as a career. You know, you often think about careers in peace building, careers in NGOs, careers in the UN. But, you know, when you're working with those who are afflict afflicted by such, you know, terrible situations of repeated sexual gender-based violence, even like torture, you know, thinking of yourself as, as being successful by working with these people is, is kind of unethical. You know, we as survivors, you know, whether whether it's myself or other people are surviving through wars in Chechnya, through the Balkans, you know, we don't want to be working with people who consider themselves career successful by working with us, you know? I mean, I think, so. so that's like the comparison I make with being a doctor. You know, if you want to be considered a successful doctor, you're supposed to show compassion and passion and empathy with your patients that you consider you can put themselves in your place. The same thing with those, I think, working, you know, from now on in the field, especially in terms of working with survivors of atrocities of war. You know, I ask you to please do not think of yourself as wanting like a career pinnacle of success if you work with certain refugees or if you work with certain survivors of this and that. Because, you know, we as like a group would feel kind of strange and feel like it was a disservice, you know, we're not a trophy for you folks to count. We are human beings and as survivors, you know, we have our own voices and everything. And on this note, you know, my the, the PowerPoint presentation I had shared with you last night that I did with the Pacific Forum, you know, one of the one of the better, um, the larger NGOs and well, I guess it's non-government. Um, the think tanks here for Civic Forum had very nicely through Yob, you know, Rob York and invited myself and my colleagues from Norway on a group called a Mental Health and Human Rights in, you know, Information to present on women, peace and security and gender-based violence issues. And on the, the last page of the presentation PowerPoint that I encourage you very warmly to share with your audience, you know, I, I did this presentation, this graph on the worries that survivors or victims of gender-based violence may have in terms of not feeling strong enough and not feeling dignified enough to contribute to society. 
and to especially contribute suggestions on how to change the current situation of how survivorhood is seen. And a lot of times, in, and you talked about the concrete examples, you know, we talked about diplomacy, the track one, track 1.5 and track to diplomacy in terms of creating, you know, perhaps ceasefire arrangements, you know, perhaps like, you know, conflict resolutions on high level meetings between the various governments, you know, usually facilitated the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or usually through a broker. And Norway, as you may know, has been like a peace broker in many, you know, situations. And, and so has President Carter in the past, you know, it's, it's like a very different discussion whether as to like these conflict resolutions and peace approaches have worked or not, including the Oslo Accord. However, you know, one of the things that, that usually was true of frustration is that although you have the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and government um, state officials who say, who give the rhetoric of including the local population, including the survivors or including the indigenous people in the track one, 1 1.5 or track two peace negotiations, I have never seen or have, I don't think I have ever seen on record the testimonies of those who survived gender-based violence to be included in part of the protocols and the policies for peacekeeping arrangements. You know, the only exception to this could be like the, the peace discussions in Colombia, where I understand that the indigenous groups of women in Colombia who went through gender-based violence and who were affected by it had like a voice in the governmental talks. But I think it's of this nature at the higher level conferences and higher level peace agreements that the voices of the survivors of gender-based violence must be present and heard. And also, you know, the government, you know, in terms of the Japanese-American relationship between Japan and, and America, you know, as I said, the history, the stories of the survivors of the Recreation and Amusement Association, you know, I have not really seen a documentary video about them. And at one point I was hoping to do like an interview of the surviving woman of the Recreation and Amusement Association and basically creating an awareness to the international society that yes, you know, in Japan, you know, many of the international community, they're aware of the hibakusha or basically those who survived the, the terrible atomic bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And many of them are very aware of the, the marginalization society during the times that you basically survived the, the atomic bombing, especially as a woman, you don't want to disclose that information because you will basically very find it very difficult to find a partner or somebody who would be interested in marrying you because your partner, your husband might be afraid that the children might come out physically, you know, um, challenge, you know, they might come out with a disability it could be like a genetic mutation that can be passed on to their generations. That's a kind of marginalization stigmatization that the hibaksha have. So you can imagine if you came out to say that you were a survivor, you're one of the women that was recruited by the Japanese government to have basically sold yourself sexually to a US soldier. And I read the accounts of, you know, these women going through um, really terrible amounts of sexually transmitted diseases, and like some of the the RA women, you know, having to sexually serve a US some officer or is having to serve 40, between 35 to 40 US officers a day sexually and earning $2 a day. And this is the actual story of what had happened. So the other day when I was at the UH campus, um, having a meeting with one of the professors there, you know, he basically very, you know, warmly encouraged me that if I have a chance and an opportunity during this lifetime, to either do like a documentary film on the remaining Recreation Amusement Association women and their survivors, or to, to pass on the, the baton to some younger documentary filmmaker. So these are the types of the, the, the purposeful political obfuscation. And in terms of the RA woman, um, I think about like three or four years ago, well, right around, right before COVID happened, um, I had several telephone conversations with military academies in the USA to ask if they knew anything of the RAA. And most of them said no. A few of them said that yes, they have indeed heard about the Recreation and Amusement Association, but they were certainly not teaching, teaching about it in their military curriculum. So I asked them to, as a survivor myself of you know, repeated sexual gender-based violence, I asked them to please include the fact that there are incidences of sexual gender-based violence you know, that must be um, openly discussed. I know that the American Air Force, you know, for instance, there was a campaign about 10 years ago 
that some of the survivors of the U.S. You know, Air Force, and these were military, that vociferously came up with their stories. And there was like an effort on having a more transparent um, transparent um, advocacy on this. But, you know, I don't know what had happened to that. But, you know, in terms of the fact that as long as I'm still alive, you know, I mean, um, I'm not going to undo the fact that I became a survivor of this issue. And it depends on how I interpret this and the way I tell the stories about how I, how I encountered this. And but you know, and one of the other things that is a very real thing is that you know we're looking we're at the stage right now, 2024, unprecedented that we have this very active and heinous war in Ukraine, and we have this you know heinous situation in Middle East. Now the two wars have created like a, a very very marked polarization in terms of the world powers, and as you know. Basically, Sweden and Finland have um, asked for accession into NATO, which they have received. And what has happened is, um, it's very interesting, you know, having lived and, you know, spent so much time in Norway, because the former prime minister of Norway is Jens Stoltenberg. Jens Stoltenberg, as a former prime minister of Norway, is the head of NATO. So, you know, I mean, I'm I'm pretty lucky. You know, I've heard, um, you know, Jens Stoltenberg speak in, in Norway, um, because that's where he's from about his role in NATO. And, you know, I, I've been following him very, very keenly. And for the last, um, I noticed from about like four or five years ago around COVID, he was having, he persistently had these like, you know, individual and private meetings with the with the prime minister of South Korea and, um, and start dialogue with um, the prime minister Shinzo Abe of Japan. So I already knew that, you know, Jens Stoltenberg was already um, thinking far in advance about the potential allegiance and alliance that was very necessary between NATO and the powers of Asia and the Far East Asia. And apparently from a year ago, um, Stoltenberg was discussing the potential um, placing of a NATO liaison office in Japan. Now, the discussion, the, just the discussion and the symbolism of potentially creating a NATO office in Japan is a very big thing because it shows like a symbol to North Korea and China and basically as potential symbols and like um, signs to Taiwan and Hong Kong that, um, that NATO will have a discussion partner and create like further global global polarization of forces into, into the West and those of not of the West in terms of how the global allegiance and the military world power will stand in the future. And as I know, you know, um, during this time, in the past couple of days or in the next couple of days, there's going to be further discussions between the United States, ROK, and Japan, with, of course, you know, the Jens Stoltenberg and NATO being informed of what are the intentions of the potential further cohesion between the United States, ROK, and, and Japan, which means that the issue of sexual violence that was committed by US military in Japan and Okinawa will be extremely inconvenient to talk about. You know, as I have expressed to you and to many people over the years, there's never like a fantastic time and a very nice and cozy time to talk about sexual military, I mean, military sexual gender-based violence. But the thing is that the more these countries, the United States, Japan, and Korea talk about creating a cohesion, the less chances there are to bring these issues up to a visible and, and transparent discussion, not just to talk about it, to create some kind of adjudication and um, amelioration and basically reparation for the survivors. And I also wish to mention that I have a very good colleague who's been very active in this situation working out of Tokyo. Her name is Catherine Jane Fisher. And like myself, she also is like a survivor of US military gender-based violence. Her situation occurred in um, Yokosuka Air Force Base in mainland Japan. And it was about, um, oh, about 15 years ago. So she and I have been informally campaigning and I can share her information. She's uh, appealed at the UN levels in Geneva several times and she has written two to three books about her harrowing experience of trying to come out as a survivor advocating for her rights to seek reparation and justice. And during this whole time, you know, her two books details the accounts of how the American embassy in Japan refused to assist her. And despite her being an Australian national, how in the beginning the Australian embassy also refused to assist her. 
and the fact that the American military and the the Japanese, you know, they seem to have corroborated in a way because um, her assailant basically um, escaped mainland Japan and went back to mainland USA to escape any kind of adjudication. So these are the concrete um, examples. And this is the reason why there are so many people, including the current governor of Okinawa, um, who wishes Denny Tamaki, who I had the pleasure of meeting last year in person, that you know we in unison you know wish to create like a change in the status of force agreement between the U.S. and Okinawa, but not only between the U.S. and Okinawa, but between the U.S. and the different um, countries and in, in Pan Asian nations hosting the U.S. military because of the natural expansion of the U.S. military in Asian you know Asian countries. So you know we find that the political obfuscation and and the and the molasses speed or the glacial speed at which the discussion of the status of force agreements changes are occurring is extremely frustrating, and you know I am on the lucky side because I speak four languages. I'm used to going to the UN, had the means to travel, and is you know and am you know willing to do this. But the other indigenous women of Okinawa, another Far East Asian woman who do not have the language capacities nor the political will to do this, they're at a handicap in a way. So I'm hoping that yourself, Maya, your students, and the next generation will concretely assist survivors like myself and other survivors, whether they're men or children in the future. So, Thanks. you know, I know I noticed that we only have nine minutes. Is it possible yeah. to show the No Nation fashion video now? Yeah, for sure. Um... Uh, we we or or Jose, would you mind queuing that up? And you know, so yes, we only have a few minutes. So while that's being queued up, um, perhaps uh, um, I will say to all you who are participating that um, Betsy did send a, a PowerPoint from a previous presentation, which we will share with you. Um, sorry, we probably won't have time for your questions, but. Um, but I'm sure Betsy will will happily respond if any of you have a burning question or wish to uh, connect with her um, around her uh, work in advocacy. And uh, yes, uh, and uh, please do, um, we will be learning about No Nation fashion um, and there's also Women for Nonviolence and Peace and Conflict Zones. So please do feel free to learn more about um, Betsy's uh, work and- uh, yeah. I'm I'm very happy to answer questions. You know, you can call me on uh, my my cell. You know, I do answer my calls and I do respond. And you know, I'm I'm I live close to Don Quixote in town, so mm -hmm. you know, between Don Quixote and the Plumber Market. So if you guys ever want to have coffee with me, I'm I'm easily available, except from the end of the month when I go back to Europe. So you know, and um, you know, as you can see, I love to talk. So, and I'm open to sharing information. So I'm at basically open for discussion. And so this No Nation fashion, just like a um, 10 second, um, I really wanted to support the No Nation fashion. It's an it's a initiative by the International Organization of Migration located in Sarajevo, which is in Bosnia. And they are a reception center for refugees from the war, primarily from Syria and Afghanistan for now but they had various refugees from all around the war affected zones to come in to seek refuge and to be um, platformed and supported for their journey forward. And during the time of COVID, there was an idea for the refugees basically and the, and the people on the move to create masks. And for the masks, um, there was a um, Sarajevo based designer who basically said that why don't they make like more garments and a capsule collection of fashion, you know, fashion garments. And they were so talented that actually they were um, they were hosted. They were invited to to show their work by the New York Fashion Week. So when I was scrolling my my Facebook on the New York Fashion Week um, things, you know the the No Nation Fashion um, No Nation Fashion project came out, and I was saying this is fascinating. Even if these are refugees and people on the move affected by the war, and they managed to escape Syria and Afghanistan they were still involved in creating like amazing creative projects. And I thought that I really, really wanted to share this. And I also had a meeting with, um, with Andrew Riley, who is professor at the University of Hawaii Department of Fashion and Design to let him know that people on the move and those in war affected areas can still show incredible ingenuity, um, the willingness to show creativity. And this 
political willingness to show creativity and to show signs of life is what you know perpetuates these people to continue to want to live to contribute to society. So I really believe in like supporting those who survive um, armed violence. So this is the reason why I wanted to show you the work of the UN International Organization of Migration Platform Project called the No Nation Fashion, which I will still always um, try to platform and share and support. So hopefully yeah, that's three minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Krenuli smo da pravimo zaštitne maske, ali onda smo shvatili da oni mogu mnogo više, da su toliko snažni i da toliko imaju veština. A je veoma nice project because it makes us be comfortable and it's so nice. I'm sorry the sound seems um kind of um yeah. It's too bad about the fact that 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 We are very proud, of course, of celebrating International Migrants Day, but also of celebrating the birth of a, of a fashion brand, which is called the No Nation Fashion, and is born out of creativity and, most importantly, the power of inclusion. Working uh, side by side, migrants and Bosnian designers have come uh, together and created this fantastic piece of art, and it shows really how much uh, diversity, intercultural exchanges, can be beneficial for the migrants and for the whole society. It is really important to recognize that migrants have contributed so much to the world. And there are so many different parts of migration. But also what we saw was these incredible people who have come here and are contributing to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I think that this is something that we can celebrate and see that there is so much um, potential that comes through migration. Ja sam, mogu da kažem, toliko uzbuđena da smo uspjeli za toliko kratko vrijeme, to je neki šest mjeseci, da napravimo kolekciju i jednu čitavu priču od 40 različitih modela. To nisu samo modeli koji su nastali u radionicama, u kamp centrima, nego smo tu imali zaista i čitavu potporu naše tekstilne industrije. We are really proud of this. And hopefully this will start to change a little bit the narrative around migration, which is often very negative, and it doesn't need to be so, because migration is a phenomenon, it's not a problem, and it needs to be humanely governed. And as we said today, and as we demonstrated today, it can bring a lot of positive benefits also for the host community. Well, thank you. I mean, it's clear through this example that there are a number of ways to be involved, to be an advocate, to um, support um, communities that have been marginalized or harmed, to build genuine inclusivity. Um, perhaps uh, we can close um, this time by um, um, just asking you to um, share, we have only two minutes, um, why you think arts and culture generally are so powerful and effective in peace building and why, why fashion in particular? Um, yeah, thank you so much. You know, part of the thing is that I think, I think, um, you know, from like a therapeutic perspective, the arts is a way to heal. You know, there's a lot of times when survivors of like incredible traumatic situations, you know, don't want to voice, don't want to tell anyone or don't want to retell their story because it brings, you know, much more um, hurt and trauma. But through art, healing, you know, through through music, through through making drawings, sketching photography and also the art of designing clothes, you know, you feel like you're creating something positive. 
And there is also, there's always a possibility of creating something new and beautiful. And, you know, and my, I was pondering over this question last night, you know, what made me, you know, decide to go back into the arts is because I felt a need to feel beautiful and whole again, you know, I mean, in the beginning, um, about 20 years ago, 20, actually, um, 23 years ago, when I first, you know, ventured out and doing this work, you know, I was really inspired and I actually felt honored and felt beautiful to work with the refugees of North Korea and everything. But, you know, as like the 20 some odd years, you know, went by, you know, you start getting a little bit tired, you start, you know, you know, dealing with all these like political obfuscation. And so, you know, there was always a time, as I said earlier, that my ultimate goal was to be like a full time artist um, and photographer. So I'm at a stage now where I can combine the past, you know, the corporate experiences I had in my advocacy and go way back, you know, into to the arts and fashion is one of the areas and actually I also wanted to express that, you know, one of the, the future projects I'm working about is going to be on the history of underwear or the history of lingerie. And the reason why I chose that subject is that um, the undergarments, you know, lingerie is known as like intimate wear. But if you really look at um, the history of undergarments in lingerie, there's a lot of political symbolism. You know, it talks a lot about the power, you know, juxtaposition between men and women, and also with the emergence and the empowerment of the LGBTQ community. There's a lot of, you know, the in, in the incorporation of the LGBT community and um, the Me Too movement in terms of how lingerie and the evolution of underwear is seen. So I'm going to be writing a few um, concept pieces on it. And, you know, you never know, it could be like a traveling show. So, you know, I think and I think, you know, what's really important and also, you know, in the film industry with the emergence of the, the Me Too movement, um, yeah, Weinstein is removed from the map, and hopefully now we have like a more women directors. You know, so on the in all the the different cultural aspects of the arts, I think it's important. You know, for for the the media to create like a different types of you know ways to to platform and to portray um survivors, whether it's like survivors of gender based violence or um you know as you just saw through No Nation Fashion, these um war survivors going through these temporary reception centers, like still showing that they're full of beautiful inspiration. And I think that's how I, I feel like, you know, there is beautiful inspiration in terms of how survivors and those who are affected by tragedies still try to express themselves. And um, through the arts, sometimes it's a lot easier than to verbally expressing something because, and also, you know, I've noticed that um, a lot of at the reception centers or those participating in the projects, you know, I, it's probably very difficult to be gay or to be trans in Afghanistan or Syria or the other countries, you know, especially if you're in Chechnya and God forbid if you're gay in Uganda these days. But, you know, if, if they have a safe haven to sew these garments, you know, and they feel empowered, you know, this is the reason why platforms like this are so important because it empowers and creates a safe haven for those who do not fit, um, you know, the, the so-called norms of society. And, you know, and I wish to continue this because, you know, as I said, you know, I felt the need to go back to the to the essence of what makes me feel beautiful from the inside and out. And it's basically to go back to the arts in many ways as possible, while still embracing the empowerment of the arts in ways to empower um, survivors. And Thank so, I, yeah, that's that's yeah. it. So um, um, those of you who are here, um, Betsy's contact information is noted in the chat, um, as uh, are other links that Jose has put there relevant to today's discussion. Thank you so much, Betsy, for your insights, uh, for your passion and your work. And thank you to all of you for being here. And we look forward to seeing you at our next conversation. Be well. Yeah. And Aloha. Thank you, Maya.